Good morning to everybody. This morning, we will try to analyze step by step how to read a positive stress myocardial perfusion scan. In order to share with you this information, I would like to start with a clinical case. We have a man of 71 years old who arrived to our attention for a recent one step of dyspnea on effort and a typical chest pain. Uh, from his anamnestic data, we can find hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, history of asthma, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So he's uh, also in waiting list for hip replacement, and due to this fact, he uh, has moderate physical activity. For he is also a little bit obese. His BMI is uh, 31, and is treated with ramipril and atorvastatin. Nothing to... Um, uh, nothing too very important from his uh, uh, laboratory examination and his EKG was normal. Uh, due to the fact that uh, he's a little bit obese, he has a pure acoustic window, but apparently he has a normal ejection fraction at ECHO without uh, nothing to uh, be underlined. So we decided to submit him to uh, myocardial perfusion scintigraphy. And uh, due to the fact that he's uh, waiting list for hip replacement, he has asthma, we decided to use uh, regadenosone with the regadenosone protocol, as we said before. In the other video, we injected regadenosone not in 10 seconds, but in one minute. Uh, following the injection, we injected a flash of saline of 10 milliliter. And then after 10 to 20 seconds to delay, we injected our tracer. In this case, we use um, Tetrophosbin, very low dose because we injected 150 <clears throat> megabecquerel, so it's uh, around uh, 3.5 millicurie. And at the end, uh, we injected aminophilin. This is the scan that we acquired with our CZT. We uh, started our acquisition after stress uh, after 15 minutes uh, from the tracer injection in order to. Uh, be very close to the ischemia time. So as uh, we say before, now we need to uh, reorient the slices uh, at the end of the acquisition. Uh, we acquired a stress before and rest. And uh, as you can see, it's very important to obtain the best realignment. And we need to be sure that uh, the alignment of the stress and rest um, data, tomographic data are completely the same in order to obtain at the end uh, a very, very good quality images uh, for your uh, uh, visual and uh, quantitative evaluation. It's really very important this phase. We need to be sure that the heart in the center of uh, uh, the picture and so on. So at the end, this is our uh, picture and uh, you see that the images is very good quality images and uh, uh, we can observe that uh, the uh, region of interest around the heart is very well positioned the uh, stress and rest uh, images are comparable so this is without uh, the region of interest around the same picture and we can start to analyze this data so uh, it's very simple because if you observe this area versus this area, you can see that there is a big amount of uh, perfusion abnormalities in the apex, in the anterodistal portion of the uh, anterior wall, and also in the uh, medium and distal portion of the septal wall. So, and with a good normal perfusion at rest here here and if you analyze the bullseye uh, the bullseye is a sort of uh, uh, 2d uh, evaluation of your left ventricle you can imagine your left ventricle like an umbrella if you open the umbrella you have the apex in the middle the center and then here you have the septal wall anterior wall lateral wall and inferior wall and here you can see there is a big area of perfusion abnormalities that is uh, quite normal after uh, rest. But it's not only the only information that you can obtain from this uh, acquisition, because 
as we can say in the other video, we can have the information of the gating because we acquired our aspect uh, synchronized with the AKG. So you can see stress here. So you see that there is uh, abnormalities of the thickening and the motion of the apex and at rest, there is a normalization of this area. So it's very important because uh, acquiring after 15 minutes, we have the possibility to analyze if there is also stunning of uh, the wall after the ischemic time. And in this case, there is a, a quite comparison between the area with uh, wall motion abnormalities versus the area of uh, perfusion abnormalities. And in, in the ischemic cascade, this is very important because the risk of this patient is increased. So you see here, here, again. And if we analyze the data that we obtained by the um, quantitative uh, analysis of our program, we can have information about volumes. The volumes is uh, uh, stress and rest quite comparable uh, with a reduction, moderate reduction of the ejection fraction after stress if we compare versus rest, 56 at rest and 50 at stress. And it's uh, due to the fact that we have stunning in the apex after the uh, ischemic time and uh, after in, in the acquisition at stress. And we have also the information about the summit stress score. So about the um, extension and severity of ischemia at stress and at rest. So it's very simple to read. We can sum the uh, points in the segments, in the different segments, like in ECO, like in CMR, it's quite the same. Zero is normal for, abs for his absence uh, of the uptake of the tracer. So you can see here uh, what is uh, the area of uh, uh, perfusion abnormalities after stress and here at, at rest. And you can imagine that it's very simple to understand that uh, this is number is very high because very uh, large is the area of uh, ischemia. While here, the number is very low because we have only a little area of reduction of perfusion at rest. But we have also information about the diastolic function that is, uh, in this case, uh, reduced during stress because it's 1.89 while at rest is 2.16. So this is a reduction not only of the uh, systolic function but also of the diastolic function. So we have a very complex patient with a big area of uh, ischemia in the LID territory with a reduction of the ejection fraction with a reduction of the diastolic function and uh, apparently uh, with uh, um, no AKG abnormalities after stress. We have information also on the, uh, the synchrony, but in this case, it's not very important for our purpose. So we need to report at the end of our evaluation what is our impression about this uh, um, analysis, this MPS evaluation. So we need to uh, write about clinical information, about uh, clinical question and indication, which is the indication for submitting this patient of myocardial perfusion scan, which type of protocol we use, and the results, and then the conclusion. So in terms of results, we need to uh, say how is the quality of our study, if we have identified artifacts or uh, technical sources of error. It's very important in order to have the best uh, quality of your results at the end, the best uh, uh, interpretation of your scan. And then we need to start with the assessment of perfusion abnormalities. So the size of the defect, the severity, where is located uh, using the segment model, for example, or uh, using uh, the um, uh, name of the segments if there is reversibility, and then, very important, the use of quantitative analysis. 
because it's mandatory to quantitate the extension and the severity of your deficit size. But then we need to assess the size of the ventricle, the function of the ventricle. If there is a, a trans, transient uh, um, dilation of your uh, uh, ventricle, and if there is, you have found uh, extra cardiac activity. This is also very important uh, in order to finalize in the best way your scan. And, uh, very, very important, you need to have also information about your functional parameters. So ejection fraction at stress and at rest, it's very important to indicate the time of uh, stress acquisition after the injection, because obviously uh, if you uh, acquire after 45 minutes, uh, probably you are not able to find any stunning, while if you acquire after 15 minutes, probably uh, it, it could be possible for you to identify stunning in some cases uh, or not. Uh, so it uh, could be of help to risk stratify your patient. But ejection fraction is a ratio, so it's very important to add also information about volumes and diastolic volumes and systolic volumes, and why not about the regional wall motion and uh, thickening abnormalities, even in presence of, for example, LBBB. And finally, uh, your diagnostic impression that is uh, corroborated by your clinical information, but that is not completely dependent on uh, your clinical information. And then uh, probably you need to add also your prognostic impression. And you need to use uh, the score that you have with your uh, quantitative analysis uh, in terms of risk. So if you have a very uh, low SSS or SDS, probably you are in front of a normal or near normal myocardial perfusion imaging. So the risk of this patient to have a cardiac event is very low. You need to underline this fact. Uh, you need to uh, be to take into account also if you have in front of uh, uh, elderly patients, especially males, if you have diabetic patients, especially female, if you have in front of a patient with a CNO cat, if you have a patient that are not uh, able to perform a very good exercise stress test, and in this case, you need to analyze very well the patient in front of you before starting the stress, because probably you need to use a vasodilator stress in some cases rather than an uh, exercise stress test or a treadmill stress test. And then, if you have any ischemic uh, uh, abnormalities uh, uh, of the AKG during uh, the adenosine or regadenosine infusion. Because uh, in presence of the, one of these cases, you uh, have an increasing of the risk. And then, uh, in order to stratify the risk of the patient, you need to report if you are in presence of multiple defects. So, in presence of two or three vascular territories with perfusion abnormalities. If the defect that you have is higher than 20% of the left ventricle, or if the defect that you have is in the LID territory, or if you have in presence of severe ischemia. Uh, if you use a normal uh, standard spec, you will be able to uh, have data also of the lung uptake at stress, that is very important. And then uh, it's very important to have information also on uh, transient uh, right ventricle visualization at stress. If you have uh, um, and uh, the visualization of the right ventricle at stress, uh, it's due to the high um, pulmonary pressure. So uh, the risk of the patient is worse and if you have ventricular dysfunction at rest. So you need to uh, underline all this data and to describe if you have this data in your MPS scan. So if you remember our uh, scan, we come back to our analysis. So 
it's very simple to understand that we have in front of a very high risk patient because we are in front of a patient with a big area of perfusion abnormalities in the LID territory with the stunning after stress because if you remember we have a stunning in the apex so we are in front of a patient with a um, reduction of the diastolic function and uh, a reduction of global systolic function. So the risk of this patient is very high. So the conclusion is that we are in front of a patient with a big area of uh, perfusion abnormalities uh, after stress in the LID territory with the presence of stunning at rest in the same territory and with uh, um, a reduction of so, systolic and uh, global, um, global systolic and diastolic function. So in this case, the risk of the patient is very high, so it should be submitted to uh, a catheterization probably. Mm -hmm. And at the end, this patient was submitted to uh, a cath, uh, was uh, submitted to an invasive coronary angiography, and you see here that uh, uh, while the uh, right coronary artery is normal, the left coronary artery presents uh, stenosis, uh, uh, important stenosis of the, was treated with uh, uh, PCA and uh, uh, positioning of stent with uh, a complete normalization of uh, the coronary artery. So uh, hoping that this uh, could be of help for you for your visualization of myocardial perfusion scan. Thank you very much again.